are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> Well, I say it's about time that we get this show on the road. Welcome, everybody, to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. I hope you all had a beautiful weekend. I know I did. Summer is here, and it was pretty much about time that we could go out and party, especially now that things are definitely getting a lot better with the pandemic. And at least for the grand majority of us, we do have our first shots. Some of you probably had your second shot. And at this point, we can go and officially begin the process of slowly bringing things back to normal. But before we go into that normal right now, we need to get back into this normal. Where in this episode, we actually do have a couple of interesting news to discuss. But before that, what I will be talking about is some very fascinating trailers. Trailers in which we will see the comeback of many beloved characters. One of which will have a whole bunch of old beloved characters that will be coming back in a fresh and a brand new way. So, with all that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall and i would like to ask you all are you ready for today's episode of animat's crazy cartoon cast let me hear it folks are you all prepared okay let's see mm -hmm. okay some people are already prepared for this all right so i believe with all that said and done it is now time that we shall go and get things started and with our first story, we're going to be talking about the animated movies that are going to be coming out in 2021. Now, I know that there is a whole lot of them, and there are definitely going to be some of which that you will completely forget that they are even coming out this year. One of which will be the animated movie that I'm going to talk about. There's a good bunch that will most likely forget that, oh yeah, this is going to be a thing in the first place. And some people might have already forgotten that they already made a first movie of this to begin with. But the fact that they have released this trailer in particular, they are definitely going to be taking this movie to a very interesting direction. So, with that said, let us begin by looking into the first trailer and our first look into Illumination's upcoming animated feature, Say Jesus! I keep forgetting that this thing is here. <clears throat> Sing 2. What do you want from me? Why do you want from me? What are you wondering? Why do you know? Why are you scared to me? my cell phone guys we're on right now no <gasps> stop i need big shows big ideas hey i have a big one with clay calloway whoa, whoa, whoa. you know calloway clay calloway is a recluse no one's seen in over 15 years i'll give you three weeks to get this show up and running i won't let you down sir better not or i'll throw you off the roof <laughs> Nothing holding me back. I have dreamt of performing in Red Shore City since I was a little kid. There's nothing holding me back. This is Red Shore City, not your little local theater. He's freaking me out. Oh, tippy toes, tippy toes. I don't see your tippy toes. This is my daughter, Portia. She wants to meet Galloway, big fan. My sister is on her way to meet him right now. Wake up! Wake up! Your destination is on the right. On the right. Okay. If you could just give me some dance lessons, you would be saving my life. How do I know that you're not a weirdo? How do I know that you're legit? I've been shaking. I love it when you go crazy. You take all my inhibitions. Baby, there's nothing holding me back. I knew you were a weirdo. Playback. She says that she's never afraid. And here she is, the star of our show, Rosita. Oh my gosh. Can I try? No, 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 no. Girl, it's on fire. She's 
afraid. She'll never be able to play the part. Maybe this is for the best. I'll write you another part, Rosita. <laughs> Callaway? Go away! Don't you miss the music? You just need to play again. No, I can't! I haven't even heard one of my songs in over 15 years. And for good reason. I have climbed the highest mountains I have run through the field it's okay but I still your songs will carry you found just sing what I'm looking for there's, there's only, only one way, way left to go, go and that's us dream big dreams that's what I always said right there's always a choice just never had the guts to make the right one. Got a robot activating piggy power. Beep, beep, boop, boop. And that was Sing 2, which is going to be coming out this Christmas, by the end of the year. And I think the first thing that I want to bring up, the first thing that I would like to discuss, and possibly something that I just absolutely despise about this trailer, do we have to start with this freaking freaky thing? Seriously, it's like, why? It's like, this is the big opening. This is how we literally start things off. <laughs> It's just freaky, seriously. And, and and the thing is, is that it's so unexpected that, like, we just immediately launch things off with this. And, I mean, this is supposed to be, like, a trailer that you show in front of kids' movies. Like, this is going to be in front of the Boss Baby 2. And yet, like, you're just going to begin, like, no warning, nothing, like, to prepare ourselves for something like this to come out. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the best representation for your movie to just immediately begin with this freaky thing. And you know, like, and, and the worst thing is, is that it's so unexpected and it'll just automatically play where you just see this freaky clown monkey going in. And, and like, you, you'll just be, like, imagine this. You're scrolling on social media and you have your videos automatically set to autoplay. So you're, you're just going in, you're just going down, just seeing what's up. And then you just go in and, oh God, suddenly this thing just pops into your feed. I don't know. That's like the one point off that I would get from this trailer is like, why do we have to start with this out of all things? Like you couldn't just start with like the little, like, you know, the little duckies, like the, t the little chim, 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 uh, duckies just singing, uh, the, like singing, hi, my name is what, you know, it, like th th there could have been a better way to start this off. But anyways, um, going back to talking about sing, since this is the sequel to, uh, well, going back to, yeah, the, the, like, this movie is technically the sequel to the 2016 Illumination movie, Sing. And I'll just start things off right now that I actually did enjoy the original Sing movie. It's not a great animated film, per se. Like, there, it, it does have its fair share of issues, but from what I remember, there are a lot of really good merits from it, and I would say it's the one Illumination film that actually did almost make me cry, actually, especially with the uh, the plot line related to Johnny. I felt like that one was really well-crafted, and like when it has its good points, it does so extremely well. And I mean, yeah, it does have like its little gimmick of having like a whole bunch of A-list celebrities coming together, voicing, talking animals, so they could go and sing pop songs. There is that aspect to it, but I will give it that there is a little bit more to it that in a way does make it one of the better Illumination films. And with the factor that there is going to be a Sing 2 coming out, considering that right now the original Sing is technically in the record books for having the biggest box office number uh, in which it never reached number one at the box office. It managed to get, like, I think 
over um like or, or maybe that's just like in the domestic box office alone or maybe in the worldwide box office but you could correct me if i'm wrong but i do recall sing never made it at number one at the box office because it was always overshadowed by rogue one at the time but it did manage to collect over 250 million dollars uh domestically just in the domestics alone just by always sitting at number two so it did extremely well for itself so of course by that point they would go and release a sequel and when I heard that there would be a sequel, honestly, I'm not necessarily all that excited, considering that, honestly, Illumination sequels are not all that great, to be honest. They're not bad. They're just, like, decent to mediocre. They're, they're around that range. Like, the only exception I could think of is just Despicable Me 2, which I still stand as possibly the best Illumination movie, and easily one of their best films right next to the first Despicable Me film. Uh, other than that, though, they're just really forgettable, like with, um, you know, like, Despicable Me 3 was pretty good. Uh, there was also The Secret Life of Pets 2. Uh, that was just, eh, you know, it was, I get like, decent but quickly forgettable. Minions also, it was uh, another one that's just, eh, it's decent. Uh, so with saying, I didn't really expect a whole lot. So from here, of course, what they are promising is kind of the same thing, where you got this massive list of a whole bunch of celebrities that are coming together to go and sing pop songs. And, like, you got a whole lot of them that are coming back, of course, like uh, Matthew McConaughey, Reese Witherspoon, uh, Scarlett Johansson, uh, Nick Offerman, Nick Kroll, and many, many, many more. Like, technically not all of them are necessarily going to be coming back, especially um, Seth MacFarlane, who voiced Mike in the original. There doesn't seem to be any signs of Mike that will be coming back to this, but it's eh, still, like, you know, that, that that's just one character compared to... Uh, many of the other characters that are already and many of the other actors that are already in this movie and especially when one of the big selling points is the fact that Bono from U2 is actually going to be playing the legendary Calloway in this movie but one thing that I do want to say about this trailer and one thing that really did surprise me is the fact that it really went heavy like i was not expecting that with this trailer they would really take this seriously because you got to really think about this this is sing this is a, like i said before this is supposed to be a cute little animated feature where a bunch of recognizable celebrities voice talking animals to which they would go and sing pop songs it's not really something that you would take really that seriously or you would expect a whole lot other than just this uh, mildly enjoyable kids flick or something like that but in this trailer however they are showing so much more like they are showing how the conflict gets real like um one ex like especially i think it's at, at the um, like honestly i would say it's uh by the two like the two minute and ten second mark or or like the the two minute yeah like in the two and a quarter minute mark like when we get into callaway's house and you see ash uh talking with uh callaway like, when, when you see that moment, that's when things really get real. Like, like just watch this again. Yes, and for good reason. Like, suddenly the, the tone just immediately shifts right there. And you see characters that are crying. You see characters that are shaking. Like that's when you that's when you know that things are really getting serious and the way that they are presenting this it's like they're doing so much more than just selling the little gimmick of sing they're really selling that there is this legit story and that the characters that we recognize from before they're going into a situation where like in some cases it's kind of like a matter of life and death where we are seeing some of the consequences of facing your fears of really pushing your limits and especially a matter of life and death actually and i think it's really buster's situation that i feel like 
It's actually quite serious because beforehand, when you think of the first movie, the, like the whole plot with Buster Moon is that, oh, we need to make, we need to go and accomplish this goal or else Buster's dream would be crushed and he would no longer have his theater and stuff like that. In this situation, they change things up to, if Buster Moon doesn't make his goal, he is going to die. That wolf is going to throw him off of the roof of a skyscraper. There's even one little moment where, like, they go quickly. Where is it? Oh, uh, where, where was it? Yeah, like, this freaking moment where you see, like, here's Buster right here being hold, held on to the wolf on top of this skyscraper. And it was like, if you don't make this happen, I'm going to freaking kill you. You better get Callaway right now or else you will die. It's like, oh my god. It's like, yeah, they, they, like they're really pushing it right now. And that's what's really shocking. And also, another thing that I do need to add into. Now, I will admit it, it has been a while since I've seen the last thing movie. Like, from, from the memory that uh, I, I expressed, like, from my opinion, it was from that last experience that I, I've seen Sing. But looking into this, I don't know about you, but I feel like Illumination has kind of really upped its game a bit, especially with the way that they have crafted their animation to feel very much grand. A especially, like, you, you do see a few examples, like the, the whole stage, for example. Like, you, you see the ma like you, you see how everything is so big, like, with the stage, or even, like, with the empty fields of... Um, Cal of like Callaway's home where he became a recluse uh, or, or, or like even like just the massive yeah like even just how every like I don't know like maybe like this is a common thing with Illumination films that maybe I haven't noticed but it's like everything just feels so grand everything's feel like everything feels pretty big and that the world is just absolutely huge or like another great example Red Shore which is supposed to be the Sing version of uh, Las Vegas, how everything is just so detailed. Like, th this is the kind of world building that we haven't seen since uh, Zootopia, where they just created this entire area uh, where talking animals just live naturally. And I definitely applaud their works just from what we have seen so far in this trailer. Now, I know the one big criticism, by the way, that I have noticed from some people is the fact that because of how long this trailer is, it is definitely quite a long trailer and that they might have revealed a little bit too much. And it is true because technically uh, the, the, the trailer is three minutes and 38 seconds, which is quite unnaturally long for a trailer for the most part. And yeah, I can see where there are some elements where it does show uh, where they might have revealed a bit too much, like especially with uh, what they want to, what the characters want to try to accomplish, rather it be with uh, Johnny, where he wants to uh, learn how to dance and really pushes himself to the limit. Or you see, uh, I think Rosita is Reese Witherspoon's character from my, from what I remember, um, where she has to face her fear of heights and she has to go and perform this act where she's like flying around in space uh, on a wire, of course. And then, uh, and then, of course, like, you got Calloway's character, which I will say, like, they really went far to present how tragic this is, especially, like, when we see Calloway, and it's like, yeah, a lot of, like, why he is a recluse, oh my god, I actually just realized something, like, technically, I, I just realized, like, suddenly, there's a, I, I just found a cameo, by the way, where um, in the picture where you see um, Callaway and his wife, like you, you actually just see like on this little corner right over here. I think that is legitimately the cat from um, from the Secret Life of Pets. It's like, oh my god, wait a minute, I recognize you. But yeah, anyways, going back to what I was talking about, yes, like you actually do see the tragedy of um, uh, of Callaway and why he has become isolated from literally everyone because of what happened to his wife and that like, we don't know the specifics, but she was in a wheelchair and you you could probably guess that now she's gone. Like she has unfortunately passed away. So you could see like, there's some real serious tragic backstory uh, that is going on, at least with the uh, Callaway character. So overall, it, it, you know, it might sound insane of me to say this, but honestly, 
with the way that this Sing 2 trailer plays out, it really feels like Illumination is kind of pitching this as a best picture movie. I mean, if you really think about it, it really does have like, it, it really does hit all the right notes in order to be a trailer for a movie that's like really emotional, that they want to present itself as this trailer that it's really going for the gold, like really going for the gold. Like it's not for the kids. It's not for the money. It's really to get the Oscars, to get the golden globes, to get the, like to get the Grammys and to get all that kind of stuff. And I mean, imagine that, imagine that that would probably be the most insane plot twist you would ever hear in the history of award season that for best picture, like sing two would be a massive contender like do like to do the one thing that lately it, neither spider-verse or soul has managed to do but sing two to be the one animated feature to suddenly rise up the ranks and actually be a legit competitor to be nominated for best picture at places like the oscars or the golden globes or the critics choice awards and all that kind of stuff how insane would that be but <laughs> anyways i'm just joking around overall though I'm not gonna lie, I honestly feel absolutely intrigued with uh, what this trailer has presented to me. The way that they are really taking things seriously, uh, the way that Illumination has kind of leveled up its animation in a way that it actually really looks impressive, especially with the world building. Uh, honestly... I feel intrigued by all this. I, honestly, this might actually have some strong potential and actually stand out, not just as a Sing sequel, but just as an animated movie in general. Might even surpass uh, the accomplishments that the first thing has actually done. So honestly, I'm actually quite impressed with the way that this trailer has caught my attention. Now, is it going to be anywhere in the levels of what we have recently seen, like with uh, Luca or the Mitchells or Ryan the Last Dragon? I don't really know. Like, that that would kind of be a little too extreme of a, of a compliment, but... I feel like at least with this trailer, they've sold to uh, they've sold this movie to me extremely well, and I'll definitely be intrigued to see how this movie is going to go when this movie will be coming out this Christmas. All right, so uh, with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all. What do you all think of this trailer for Sing 2? Are you guys impressed with what you saw? Are you guys a little hesitant about seeing this movie? Let me know what you all think. <clears throat> Alright, let's see what we got here. I remember loving and watching the first movie a lot. My favorite character was Ash. I'm so in love and um, uh, th I was so in love and that I was simping over her and remember hearing about a sequel being in development after the first one came out. Considering the first movie was my favorite movie from Illumination and to some as the best one from the studio, the sequel will be very heartwarming, deep, amazing, and emotional. All right, that's pretty nice. Uh, it's nice to see that Johnny's still the best character, but aside from that, I'm impressed. The animation is pretty banging. I got a good laugh a bit with Miss Crawley driving, and uh, it looks very, it looks weirdly poignant, so I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, that's one thing I forgot to mention. If there is one laugh that I actually did get, is actually from uh, from Miss Crawley's driving, where she's just singing the song, like, wake up, wake up! <laughs> shake up, shake up, and it's like drive right. Okay, drive right. It <laughs> just goes off. That I will admit is funny. Anyways, <clears throat> but I think the funniest part of the movie so far is whenever Illumination promotes the film on Instagram, they always have to tag Eric Andre with his incredible but inappropriate Instagram handle. I mean, what could I say? Like, it might sound crazy, but one thing that I do admire from Illumination is that more than literally any other studio, they are the masters of marketing. They know how to sell their pictures. And I don't necessarily mean just with the trailers and stuff like that, but in terms of advertising and promotion and stuff like that, they know how to make things work and they know how to connect with today's general audience. They know how to get, how to get people to come see their movies i mean why else do you think the despicable me films would make a billion dollars each or at least starting to especially with the first minions and despicable me 3 i wouldn't be surprised if minions rise of Gru would be another billion dollar hit or hell 
if this movie would become a massive success too. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Um, my reaction for this trailer is the same reaction as the wolf when he's auditioning all the animals in the beginning, and for good reason. Oh, this is interesting. Illumination is taking a dark and serious tone with this. The first half of the trailer didn't get me all that hyped, but the second half, when the tone shifts, uh, is the point that gets me excited. This trailer makes me believe that Illumination has the potential uh, to become their best film. And yeah, <laughs> and this has, and this is yet, uh, the and they have yet to even show their Mario movie. And the fact that, like, th with this one they're showing potential, it, you know, it, it shows promise. Uh, let's see. As someone who enjoyed the first Sing movie, I admit this trailer is not bad. It's taking its, uh, it's taking its serious direction from the first movie. Also, I think that there is a Muppet reference somewhere. Uh, also, also, looking, uh, looking at the Wolf Girl character, well... Looks like Luna from Hell of a Boss now. Uh, looks like Luna from Hell of a Boss now has some serious competition. Yeah, that is honestly the one thing that I have been hearing a lot about. That if there is one thing that caught a lot of people's attention is actually the Wolf Girl from uh, th yeah, right somewhere in the middle. Hold on, it's actually like the White Wolf's. Um, yeah, here here she is. Yeah, it's the white... Yeah, her. Right here. Like, the daughter of the, the white wolf executive. Like, people are really... Like, apparently right now, people are actually going crazy over this girl. That they think, like... You know, she... Like, the new, the new one that you could say the furries are really going crazy over. So... That, that, that's one thing that I am quite familiar. I'm not gonna go t too deep into it, but... Yes, I am aware that this is a thing. Oh, I almost forgot something, actually. Uh, just give me a sec. <laughs> uh, I almost uh, forgot to open the uh, scoreboard. Just to uh, let that happen, uh, to let that activate. Okay, should be fine by now. All right. All right, so I'll let that do its thing. Uh, any other comments? Just want to double check, actually. Ah, there we go. Okay, and now it just properly uh, uh, activated. Uh, let's see. This trailer really got me interested. I personally really enjoyed the first thing. Now, when it comes to this film, after watching this trailer, I'm actually pretty optimistic. It does seem like it is keeping a lot of what made the first film enjoyable. I am also really surprised how serious this trailer was, and it could focus more than on that than the comedy. However, I really don't know if Sing 2 is really going to do well at the box office, considering it's coming out after Spider-Man No Way Home. Well, like I said before, the first Sing was a massive success, despite the fact that it was released at the same time as a Star Wars movie. More specifically, um, Star Wars, um, was it Rogue? Yeah, Star Wars Rogue One. So from there, I can imagine that even if it would be released at the same time as No Way Home, Sing 2 will still do extremely well. So even if there is that direct competition, technically, it's like No Way Home is not going for the same audience as Sing 2. Even if Sing 2 never makes it at number one, it could still make a lot of its money. So don't, under don't underestimate its power. All right, I think I'm going to go and read uh, one more comment before we jump into the uh, next story. As someone who really loved the first thing, this actually, uh, this absolutely interests me. The characters are stronger than ever. The animation looks fantastic and even better than the first one. Uh, the score sounds awesome and it looks like it will take itself a lot more seriously. I feel like this flick might, uh, might be the inverse of Spider-Verse and the Peanuts movie for Illumination because this trailer, of course, will be more than happy to check uh, this movie because the trailer, of course, I will be more than happy to check this out and I'll make sure to bring a box of tissues. Man, that... That is some uh, high praise, actually. Actually, I'll read one more. One, one more. Just one more before we jump into the next. It starts off like any average Illumination movie, but then around the last minute, hot damn, did things get intense. Considering Illumination is mostly comedic with their movies, this was some insane mood whiplash. Uh, if this is genuinely what they are going with this movie, this will probably be the first Illumination movie that had me interested for a long time. So yeah, one thing I will say right now, what I'm not going to be excited about is going to be when I will be uploading this podcast episode onto YouTube because 
You never know what's gonna get copyright claimed, either the trailer itself or whatever song that they have sung in this. Okay, so for our next story that I have or over here or the uh, next trailer that I have, we're going to be looking at something that some people might consider to be a dream crossover. Many people have dreamed of this moment or have that full experience to see these two characters come together. We often get teased a lot, especially during the banners and stuff like that, during, uh, uh, during like the commercials on Cartoon Network. But it looks like now, Warner Brothers is really going to take it seriously, and they will devote an entire movie for this crossover. So with that said, let us go ahead and check out our next trailer, which will be straight out of nowhere, Scooby-Doo meets Courage, the Cowardly Dog. Come on, let's go! We gotta catch up with Scooby-Doo! <laughs> In the middle of nowhere... <laughs> Oh! Scooby-Doo found a little courage. That's me! It's my friends. Oh! And a lot of adventure. Like, man, this place is totally freaky. Why is the water dripping upward? Now... If you're in a situation... I've never seen cicadas that big before. More weird and creepy mysterious stuff happens in nowhere than anywhere else in the world. It's on our flag. If you're scared, then welcome to the town that is Enjoy. Yes, my own. There's nowhere to run. The insects grow to crazy sizes here. Wicked is a compliment. Bananas is a burst. Bravery, I'm confident. It's still a dirty word. And nowhere to hide. Nowhere, Scooby Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. Ooh, jackpot! Watch the masters at work. Needs more mustard. <laughs> Excuse me, must have been something I ate. <laughs> Look for it on digital and DVD. And that was straight out of nowhere. Scooby Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. And one thing I will say that actually is pretty interesting, like I said before, we've often been teased a lot during the commercials of Cartoon Network where we would see those like quick little crossovers where we see Scooby-Doo interacting with Courage the Cowardly Dog. Or maybe those little interactions from time to time, like something on Cartoon Cartoon Fridays or something like that. Like we would see those little moments, but we never had like a full episode or we never had like a full experience where we see the Scooby-Doo gang meet up with Courage the Cowardly Dog and they would go onto those crazy adventures. And I do get why we would see those two come together. And it really makes sense in a way because... Like, they're both franchises in which the starring character is technically a talking dog, and they would go and solve mysteries, and there is a little bit of that horror element uh, put into it. So there are some similarities between Courage and Scooby-Doo, where it is enough that if you do put them together, then it would seem like it would make sense that they would belong in the same world. And that is essentially what they are presenting here. That's what they are kind of pitching with this movie. It's like this massive crossover with two beloved and very nostalgic franchises. And by the way, that's also one thing that I do want to mention that uh, is kind of interesting to see. The fact that the recent uh, D uh, Scooby-Doo direct-to-video movies, that they're kind of like leaning more 
towards that department, that they really are going towards nostalgia, and that they are bringing back uh, some classic elements throughout the Scooby-Doo franchise, and that they're kind of like revisiting revisiting them in a brand new way. Like we recently had uh, Scooby-Doo return to Zombie Island, or uh, they kind of brought back the 13th, uh, the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo. And now they're doing this, where this is the first time in many years that we saw uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog, and now he's actually coming back. And with a, a dream crossover with Scooby-Doo. So I understand why this concept is made. And I do understand why uh, a lot of people seem to be extremely excited over the fact that we are seeing this movie happen. Because it's not just the crossover itself, but it's also to see the comeback of Courage of the Cowardly Dog, in which we haven't seen in godforsaken years. And especially with um, Cartoon Network being in such a mood of rebooting many of their old shows, then why not bring back Courage of the Cowardly Dog? I know that's a pretty controversial hot take right there, but honestly, there are ways where you can actually bring back courage, and it could actually work in today's day and age, especially with uh, this new fashion, uh, this new fascination with horror, or what is the modern definition of horror. I, I could see how courage could actually really play into that. However, with that said, though, I will say even if it's actually a really awesome idea for this kind of movie. I don't know if I would be interested in actually seeing it or if I would feel like this is going to be the kind of movie that it feels like it's going to be awesome. Like, oh, I gotta watch this. This is going to be great. Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, even though this is a pretty cool crossover with Scooby-Doo and Courage, this is still a direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie. And let's be honest, in this day and age, when it comes to the new recent stuff, they have been doing pretty badly. In fact, from what I've been hearing, they are among some of the worst. Like, I have yet to hear an actual really good thing about either Return to Zombie Island or it's Halloween Time Scooby-Doo or anything like that. And especially even when watching this, even when seeing the trailer for uh, Straight Out of Nowhere... There are a lot of things where, for me, it feels like it will still be in that level of quality. And I think, for me, like, one big indicator is the villains. Because with Courage the Cowardly Dog, you can think of so many different characters that have great potential to actually play the main villain in uh, this kind of movie. Like, if Courage would have his own feature, yeah, you would expect, like, a pretty big and ultimate villain. But what do we have here? Giant bugs. Like, that's really what it is. It's just giant cicadas, and that's it. It's like, really? This is the best you could think of? Like, you, you can't just bring back uh, any old characters and really prominently play them as villains? Now, granted, it is true. Like, even throughout this trailer, you would see, like, a whole bunch of, like, little references here and there of, like, old classic characters. Like, like you got Bigfoot over here. Or there's even at one point, or like even like this dude, I, I I forgot his name, but I remember he was pretty prominent uh, throughout the Courage, uh, you, you know, throughout like the Courage show, like w with some um, e episodes. Like I, I remember, yeah, he was like he was like the do yeah, like it just came back to me. He was like the doctor. He was like the psychiatrist. He was like the medical expert of nowhere. And um, there's also another part where they go through like uh, this door or something like that. Hold on, I'm trying to find it if I can um like they go through this secret passage I remember um hold on a second it's just I'll, like I'll let this play a little bit but there are like other references as well uh that 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 they have done here like yeah like you'll find also other references like you see a bunch of like like a portrait of like the other dogs that appeared in uh in Courage uh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to see, because I remember there was at one point, like, th there was this, like, this secret passage that they went, I'm not crazy, I swear, like, did, was it, like, early on or something like that, or, hold on a sec, oh yeah, okay, so it is early on, 
Yeah, like right over here. That's another example. Like you'll see, like they went through this secret passage, and you'll see, like on, like um, like next to Muriel, there is like there's the duck, and then you'll see, like, but right behind Daphne, there's like the like that that cat character. Like you, you guys, if you've seen Courage, you guys remember that tall, lanky, evil cat. Like, like you'll get those like little references here and there. They'll do a lot of that, but in terms of the main villain, it's honestly pretty disappointing that. Really, the best that they could think of is just giant bugs, and that's it. They'll, that That's going to be your main villain throughout this entire movie, and it's kind of disappointing because, like, you can't really think of something better than that. It's just going to be giant sentient bugs and stuff like that. I, I don't know. I feel like you could do a lot more to really indulge yourself, to make it feel like the Scooby-Doo gang are really in the world of uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog. So, uh, and also, another thing that I want to point out that is honestly a little bit concerning as well is the fact that, by the way, no, uh, the creator of Courage, John, uh, John Dilworth, he's not actually going to be involved with this movie. He's not actually attached to it, so it is purely just Warner Brothers Animation that is going to be working on it. So, the fact that they don't actually have the creator of Courage to actually be involved with this, to actually truly capture that Courage feel, like, that is also another major point off, honestly. So, yeah, there's, there's really a lot of things that, honestly, they are going against it. And it really is kind of dependent on going with this gimmick of just Scooby-Doo meets Courage of the Cowardly Dog and not really doing all that much else. That they, they just have this very simple plot line and that they're just going with it. And, like, the most that you'll see with other Courage elements is just going to be references here and there. And that's it. Just, like, quick little reference when they go into the Doctor's house and, like, you'll see all the different Courage elements. So, overall, for me, it's like... Yeah, I do get the appeal. I do understand why some people would be very much excited for this. But at the end of the day, it is still a direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie. And the fact that they haven't been doing that well nowadays, not necessarily financially, but in terms of the reception from audiences who have seen it, it uh, like, my expectations are honestly kind of low, really. Like, I'm not expecting a whole lot out of this. I, I mean, I could be wrong, of course, this could actually turn out to be pretty good, but after watch, but after seeing this trailer, there's not really enough for me uh, to actually get myself excited to see this picture. So overall, honestly, it's just like, I kind of feel like it is a bit of a pass. Like, I'll just wait and see with um, how people are going to react to it, what, what are their thoughts, and... If it is actually pretty positive, then I'll consider checking it out. But right now, I don't think I'm in any rush to go and get the DVD myself. Okay, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall right now. And I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about the trailer for Straight Out of Nowhere, Scooby-Doo meets Courage of the Cowardly Dog? Are you guys um, a, a little iffy with what you have seen on this trailer? Are you guys excited to actually see the crossover of Scooby-Doo and Courage? Let me know what you think. Okay. Uh, this may be a crossover uh, to... Oh, this may be a crossover to of my childhood favorite shows, but I'm honestly not really that engaged for this. Uh, there are some fun moments of this trailer, sure, but this doesn't really have the fun and horror from both the original Courage or Scooby-Doo. And the fact that John Dilworth have, has no involvement in this just sucks. Stupid War... Stupid Warner Brothers! Oh, <laughs> stupid Warner Brothers! You make them look bad! <laughs> yeah, I see where you're going with that. Uh, let's see now. Uh, given that Scooby-Doo doing so many crossovers with stuff like WWE, DC, Bill Nye, and now Courage, uh, what, uh, what other crazy crossover can they do? Scooby-Doo meets Fallout, Scooby-Doo meets Mega Man, Scooby-Doo meets Castlevania, Scooby-Doo meets Hasbin Hotel, Scooby-Doo meets Metroid, Scooby-Doo meets Star Fox... Scooby-Doo meets Transformers, the last one, uh, better have a toy in the mystery machine that turns into a robot. Honestly, I would, yeah, like, 
they, they're pretty much in the mood to go into these crazy crossovers. And like I said, they really like uh, the Scooby-Doo movies right now. They really are leaning more towards nostalgia. And technically, there is one idea that I do have that honestly, I find this to be perfect. Like technically, it is the perfect kind of crossover, but they would really have to have some good hands to actually go and act and actually craft that kind of crossover if they would do it because. The, the crossover I'm talking about, there's actually a really devoted fan base that if you mess things up, oh, they can turn nasty. Like, imagine this. Scooby-Doo meets the Haunted Mansion. That is absolutely perfect right there. And I mean, like, already that kind of concept, like, it's soul. But it's going to be extremely tricky because that would, that would rely on the crossover and a collaboration from Warner Brothers and Disney. So you could see how, like, there is that element of impossibility, but if it does happen, it would be a match made in heaven. But, again, you gotta have some really good hands actually working on this. You can't have the typical team working on the usual Scooby-Doo direct-to-DVD films. Like, if you can actually get the team from, like, Disney Television to actually work on that crossover... Then we're talking. Like, now we're actually talking of a potential idea for a good crossover. Uh, let's see... What else do we have here? This somehow feels like an out of nowhere haha <laughs> crossover and a perfect match at the same time. The personalities of the characters from both shows match decently enough and the comedy seems fine enough. So I might check it out if I have nothing to do. But I don't know if it's just me, but the tagline made me think at one point Scooby-Doo is going to be singing straight out of nowhere, st straight out of nowhere, crazy bugger rocker named Scooby. Yeah, I can write my role on rocker rocker Ruby. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the biggest plot twist of them all. Straight Out of Nowhere is actually going to be a remake of Straight Out of Compton with Scooby and and Courage. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm surprised there are no, like, t-shirt parodies that are actually made of that. Anyways. I don't actually mind that John Dilworth is involved. It looks fun and silly to have these two characters interact. It makes me hope uh, for Courage to come back and maybe also horror-themed kids shows. I think I'll watch uh, I'll watch it when it comes out on HBO Max. Uh, wonder who is voicing Eustace and Muriel. Both Eustace original voice actors are dead, and I don't think that Wallace Shawn's vo that that's Wallace Shawn's voice. Also, wait, Courage doc Courage's doctor is in this? Did they whitewash him? Granted, he was an Indian stereotype. I have no idea, honestly. Like, I could be wrong, of course, but it's like, there's something about that design. It, it just feel it, it just felt absolutely familiar. And I'm not, like, I, I try to remember. It escaped my memory, honestly. I don't know who's voicing Muriel, but I do know, I think it is Jeff Bergman who is going to be voicing Eustace. Uh, all right, I think, uh, okay, I'll go read two more comments, then we jump into the next one. Uh, let's see. A crossover movie of Scooby-Doo and Courage the Cowardly Dog is something uh, I didn't expect happen. I grew up with Scooby-Doo and especially Courage the Cowardly Dog since it is one of my favorite Cartoon Network shows, but don't know if I want to be excited about this. I'm iffy with the story, villains, and Courage's design since Muriel and Eustace look fine. Uh, upon not having Dilworth being involved with just WB animation taking control, I have my expectations low, so overall I'm not that excited. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have. This would be an awesome and fun movie to watch. Scooby and Courage have been teaming up before with commercials in the past, but this is a legitimate thing to happen. I might check it out because, although I'm not a huge Scooby-Doo fan, I did enjoy Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. At least it's better than the Tom and Jerry crossovers. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, I do agree with you. I mean, like, the earlier Scooby-Doo um, Scooby direct-to-DVD movies, like, those were great. Like, they were definitely awesome to watch, especially with uh, Zombie Island and uh, The Witch's Ghost. But you got to keep in mind that nowadays, they certainly are not what they used to be. Again, stuff like It's Halloween Time Scooby-Doo and Return to Zombie Island, they are definitely not on par with the original Zombie Island. So overall, at least for me, I'm not necessarily all that excited to see what they might have in store with this uh, movie. So who knows? Maybe it could turn out good. Maybe it could turn out bad. But... At the end of the day, it is still a direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie, so we'll just see what happens.
All right, so now we have one more trailer to go and present to you, and this is actually going to be a pretty smooth transition because we are going to be jumping from one Hanna-Barbera property to many Hanna-Barbera properties. Yes, we know that there are some uh, Hanna-Barbera shows that they're going to be pretty busy, especially right now with Scooby-Doo doing their own thing, and uh, The Flintstones is actually going to get an adult animated series starring Pebbles, but as for the rest, they will all be together for one massive show in which it will be coming out on HBO Max called Jellystone. There is a place, a magical place, a place where nothing strange ever happens. <laughs> Okay, well, it's still a place. I'm so glad you guys wanted to hang out. I'm so excited. Welcome to Jellystone, a town chock full of characters trying to live. I've learned the ways of the grocery store, and I am now more powerful than you could ever imagine. Work. <gasps> we're doctors, and we're about to do doctor-type things. Aha. Mm. Mm. And play together. Uh. Join Yogi. Suit up. Cindy. I'm administering a sedative. And Boo Boo. I'm being sued for malpractice. In the new series Jell- uh, Howdy there. Also Huckleberry Hound. In the new series Jell- I'm Jabberjaw. And also Jabberjaw. In the new series Jell- Hi. Oh. And Top Cat. And Snagglepuss. Elkabong. Wally Gator. Oggy Doggy. Doggy Daddy. The Banana Splits. Cool. Johnny Quest. Haji. Shag Rug. Captain Caveman. And, and, man, there's a lot. In the new series Jellystone. Streaming July 29th on HBO Max. According to my calculations, this should be fun. And that is Jellystone, which is going to be coming out next month, uh, if the, that is what they just said. Yes, on July 29th, uh, Jellystone, in which it will be the new series that will be coming out on HBO Max. And um, it's honestly kind of funny to see uh, this new rebooted Jellystone, especially with the fact that it's not necessarily the same characters uh, that we have seen before. But this is still a brand new series that will be brought to us by C.H. Greenblatt, which you probably know him best as the creator of Chowder. And you could definitely tell that his print is definitely everywhere on this and that he was definitely in charge of not just a reboot, but a full-on reimagining of all these uh, Hanna-Barbera characters. And especially like when you look at, it, at his design... Like, this is his style everywhere that, like, you probably remember Hanna-Barbera has that distinct look, but in, in this time around, like, it's C.H. Greenblatt, and you could tell, like, he has his own style, his own way of designing characters, and honestly, it actually does work out because the, the, the best way to describe Greenblatt's design is that it has its, you know, it, it, it's, it's charming. It, it has its own cute, simplistic style um, that that could just bring up cartoon characters in an easy way, but in a way that also looks enjoyable and very much open for whatever type of silly SpongeBob style comedy would actually ensue. And honestly, I'm very much open for it uh, to see like a full on reboot of all these different characters, like to see a new version of them, even if they're not necessarily themselves. And I'm going to be honest, a lot of them, they kind of need to be rebooted. We need new versions of these characters. Like one thing I will say right now that I'm actually glad that they're going to do is actually give a full on reboot to Cindy that they're actually going to give her a, uh, they're actually going to go and give her a personality. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Like, just want to find, like, a good image of where we could see Cindy. And, like, because the thing is, the reason why I'm glad to see this new Cindy Bear is because when you do think of Cindy in, like, the classic Yogi Bear series, or even, like, in Hey There is Yogi Bear and stuff like that, Cindy is just the girl bear. Like, that's literally just her role, is to be the attractive girlfriend to Yogi Bear, 
and really nothing else. It's 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 honestly hard to really find uh, that much of a personality in there. Not saying that she never had one before, but really she just emphasized the fact that she is a girl and that she is in love with Yogi Bear and that's it. Here, however, we actually do see this new side to Cindy Bear where now they're actually leaning her more towards this scientist route. They're, they're, they're like, they want to lean, they want to put her more into the intelligence side of things, or at the very least, show her as the smart one when compared to Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. And that's actually also another uh, reimagining that I never thought they would legitimately do, but I, I honestly kind of find it funny that they actually did so. Hold on, like, just, just like, watch this. And Boo Boo. I'm being sued for malpractice. <laughs> like, this part over here, honestly, it kind of makes me laugh because right over here, like, at least in this part alone, they just turned Boo Boo into Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons. Like, really just full-on empty-headed, and whatever dumb line he would say just sounds hilarious. Like, even with, with what Boo Boo just said here, I feel like it would be the same kind of line that Ralph would say, even in that tone as well. Like, like just imagine, like, I'm being sued for malpractice. And like, Boo Boo, say, and Boo Boo, please say that again. Boo Boo, I'm being sued for malpractice. Full on Ralph from The Simpsons. He would say the exact same thing. So honestly, that is also a pretty funny thing. Uh, that they are doing but also another thing that they really are selling is the fact that they are bringing back so many different uh, Hanna-Barbera characters at, at once that they want to give all these guys a chance uh, to come back into the spotlight now for the 21st century but I will say this though there is one group of characters that honestly I was shocked to see them come back and after what we have seen them do last time I'm surprised they have the balls to return in a kid-friendly animated series. You know which ones I'm talking about. These boys over here. The frickin' Banana Splits. They are coming back, baby. Oh, man. I, the, like, I, I, honestly, I feel surprised that they legit got the balls to return to a kid-friendly animated series after what we have seen them last time. Because you guys recall beforehand, the, the Banana Splits, they wanted to have a bit of a reboot, but they decided to go into the Five Nights at Freddy's route and try to be this R-rated horror flick. And that's where we resulted in the uh, Banana Splits movie. And now we see them come back in this, it's like... You got some guts to come back after what you've pulled off, but okay, if you if you if you want to come back to be kid friendly, all right, I won't stop you. But still, man, it's just after what you tried to do, like that that that's a pretty interesting move. I'm not gonna lie. So seeing them come back is pretty funny, and it's also like okay, I like to see what you guys are gonna do. Like imagine this. Imagine in Jellystone that they would legit do a reference to that movie. <coughs> Excuse me, but like even in this picture alone, like you 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 kind of have you kind of feel this ominous presence coming from them. Like, I would applaud Jellystone if they would legit do a reference to the Banana Splits movie. I, I just need to lay that out there. And no, just their appearance alone is not going to count. But also another one that I am honestly kind of surprised that they decided to bring back is actually some of the more serious Hanna-Barbera characters. Or at least the Hanna-Barbera characters from the more action-packed and more serious kind of shows. Like, one example that we have seen throughout... Um, uh, let's see, like, yeah, he, there, there's this one part here where we see uh, Shazan the Genie that he's just selling, like, free samples with crackers and stuff like that. That's one example. But also another one that, like, I feel like is actually one of the coolest reboots, actually, is, um, right, uh, no, not Shag Rug, is right here with um, Johnny Quest and Haji that now they are back, but they're, like, they're not, they didn't just come back, but now they're, like, full-on adults. Like, even Haji got, like, a full-on, like, upgrade with a mustache, a beard, and everything. And honestly, I don't know if they would go into this direction. I don't know if Jellystone would actually have the guts to do this. But honestly, seeing these two right over here, 
I'm curious to know, is Johnny Quest and Haji a couple? That would be an interesting thing, and I would not be against it if they would legit do so. And, and I mean, like, if you do think about it, especially with um, what Johnny and, and Haji went through, like, uh, like with all their adventures throughout the decades, like, that would kind of make sense. You could actually imagine that, where you see both Johnny and Haji suddenly fall in love, and they decided to get together. So, uh, honestly, that, that would be an interesting thing that I would see. And if they decide to go into that direction with the reboot, honestly, I would definitely applaud them. So that would definitely be a, 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 an interesting turn if, if they decide to do so. So, and yeah, like even in here, you definitely see a whole lot of other characters that uh, they didn't even bring up. Like you see um, uh, the hillbilly bears that are going to be there. Like, of course you got freaking grape ape with his giant butt in, in on the side. You got like Magilla gorilla, uh, who has his glasses? Did, did Wally Gator have glasses? Like you got Three Musketeers, uh, Pixie. Yeah, like you also got Pixie and Dixie and Mr. Jinx and so many other characters. Like like every every single one of them. Like if they're not like the world famous characters, then they're gonna appear here. Or actually, that would be interesting to see. Like if they were if there would actually be appearances from like some of the bigger characters. Like one episode where we would see the Jetsons suddenly coming in, or the Flintstones, or even Scooby Doo himself like the possibilities are very much endless and honestly overall this has me intrigued as someone who was a major Hanna-Barbera fan um honestly I feel like this is a full-on reboot that Hanna-Barbera would definitely need and it definitely looks charming it looks cute and it of course it looks funny as well like it will manage to find a way to be its own thing but uh, stay true to the spirit of Hanna-Barbera, especially with the fact that it is coming from C.H. Greenblatt, and even though I haven't seen full episodes of Chowder, I definitely have seen a lot of clips from the show, and they are flat-out hilarious, especially with some of the fourth wall breaking that they have done. So, uh, overall, honestly, color me intrigued. I am honestly curious to see how things would go with uh, this one. And again, if you are interested in checking out this series, then all you have to do is wait until uh, July 29th for this show to come out on HBO Max. And with that said, I would like to go on to the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about Jellystone? Uh, are you guys interested in checking this series out? Would you be open to seeing a new version of all these Hanna-Barbera characters? Are you a little doubtful that they might change a little too much with uh, these characters? Let me know what you all think now. Okay, let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see. Uh, some people are saying it was like Johnny Quest, Johnny Quest. Like, did I, did I mention, a th did I accidentally say Johnny Tess or something? Anyways, okay. Anyways, back to what I was talking about. Well, I think we all knew what this was go going to be since 2019. I feel like people are being too harsh on the character designs. And I know people are going to complain about the kill art style. I'm not going to pretend I'm a fan of these character designs, but I think people nowadays are too harsh on character designs in Western animation. Uh, maybe it can boil down to characters not being hot. Uh, I don't think I'll watch it, but I'll be supportive of the, of the show conceptually. Have people really been complaining about the character designs in these? I don't know. I feel like they really do work out. And I mean, it's freaking Hanna-Barbera. I mean, like, the, the, the original Hanna-Barbera designs are really no different than what we have over here. I mean, like, what, are you disappointed that Cindy doesn't have some TNA or something like that? I mean... Really, it's it's hard to really imagine. This is like, what is there real? It's like, what like if you really are complaining about the character designs, it's like, what else did you expect? What else do you want from this show? Especially when it is coming from the guy who made Chowder. Uh, let's see. Um, I wasn't too keen on this at first, but upon watching the trailer, I gotta say it looks quite delightful. The art style is nice. I like that they're trying to give Cindy a personality, and seeing that the creator also made one of the funniest cartoons in recent years, it's no surprise that it's absolutely hilarious. But the biggest surprise uh, of the show is seeing the banana splits going, "Oh hell yeah, we're going on a killing spree too!" Oh hey Yogi, you good? <laughs> yeah, really. That that is such a that that's probably one of the biggest tone shifts of all. If it's not what we have seen from Sing Two, it's definitely what's going on with the banana splits. Like going on a full on go gore fest 
to just hanging out with Yogi Bear and the gang. <laughs> Seriously, like that that is just like a massive piece of irony right there. And it, that's why I still find it so funny of the fact that like we're we're seeing um like, like we're seeing the banana splits on a kid series. It's like, so you want to come back and you want to go for kids, eh? <laughs> What is this, like the godforsaken 70s and 80s where they're trying to go and make animated shows for kids based on R-rated movies? <laughs> uh, seriously, remember when that was a thing back then? <laughs> Anyways, um, I know some people don't like this, but I am liking this. I love Chowder, and this certainly feels quite similar. The art style looks really good, the humor is good, especially with the I'm being sued for malpractice. And it will be fun, fun it will be interesting to see all of these characters return. Count me in. Hopefully this will be treated better than how Nickelodeon handled Harvey Beaks. Yeah, that is true, but I will say, then again, this is C.H. Greenblatt going back into Warner Brothers territory. Like, he was, like, I, I think from what I've heard, he's been treated fairly well with how things went with Chowder. Maybe I I'm wrong, but, uh, like, he definitely was treated better for Chowder than he was for Harvey Beaks. And, uh, even, like, even in this... Like, he is going back to, uh, he is going back to the Warner Brothers territory, so, but he'll most likely go in the direction where he'll be treated the same way with, uh, Chowder, at least. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? This show looks a lot of fun. While I'm not a huge expert when it comes to Hanna-Barbera characters, some of these characters absolutely deserve a reboot, and it is in the comedy is really good, and the animation looks fun. And this honestly seems like a better crossover than the Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like, I spent, like with the way they started things off with Scooby-Doo, I am not on board with that. But what we have gotten with this so far, it's like Jellystone already did what the first Scoob, what Scoob failed at, honestly. It's make a solid Hanna-Barbera crossover and to make us excited to see those Hanna-Barbera characters come back again. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, uh, Jellystone looks really fun. Even though the creator of Chowder is making this, I don't expect a lot of fourth wall breaking humor or randomly changing mediums from stop motion to puppets. Also, I showed this to my dad, and when they gave shoutouts to the character, he was like, Hey, what about Megilla Gorilla? How come he didn't get a shoutout? Well, I mean, there are a lot that didn't get a shoutout. Again, like, not just Megilla Gorilla, but I mean also, uh, like, Grape Ape, Pixie and Dixie. Uh, like, the, li the, the, the list goes on. I mean, like, you, and especially the fact that this is a less than 90 seconds trailer, you can only, you, you can only, like, do so much with your time, so... Yeah, not all of them are going to get reference or anything like that. But, hey, at least, like, they did highlight some of, like, the more significant ones. Or at least uh, some of the more, uh, like, some of the ones that might play a bigger role in this series in particular. So, so we'll just see how things might actually go. And, by the way, one thing I will mention right now, uh, in terms of the fourth wall breaking... Like, yeah, maybe you're right that maybe they won't go as much into fourth wall breaking as much as Chowder... But this is still Hanna Barbera, and Hanna Barbera has never been shy with doing fourth wall breaking jokes. So I wouldn't be surprised if we would also see them right over here. All right, I think I'm gonna go and read one more comment before we jump into the next one. To be honest, I actually like it. Uh, like I did like everything that this presented. Almost the same comedy style as much as Chowder, since of course the H Green Black makes uh, the superior version of Ren and Stimpy eat your heart out, John K. Uh, heck, even my brother enjoyed it when uh, it, it, we even uh, watched it like five times. Overall, I'm hyped uh, and interested in watching Chowder again. It's going to be great. I know it. Well, it's nice to see that a lot of people are pretty positive for this, so if you guys are interested in Jellystone, then remember, it's going to be on July 29th on HBO Max. Alright, so, the trailers are officially done, so now it's time that we got to go into a couple of Disney news. And a lot of these are actually pretty interesting. Because as of recent, you might be familiar with the fact that we have been hearing so much about Disney uh, starting to do a lot of plans with turning a lot of their theme parks into, well, not just theme parks, but a lot of their rides 
into movies. And we have heard a few that are really early in development. They're doing a Haunted Mansion reboot. No, not with Guillermo, de, uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, they're doing uh, Space Mountain, I believe. And there's also another one that's just been announced. And this might actually sound interesting considering the people that they have involved. And what I'm talking about is regarding the Tower of Terror. Yes, Scarlett Johansson is teaming up with Disney to not only produce, but to also star in a movie that is inspired by the classic Walt Disney World attraction, The Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror. Now, there is no official word about who else is going to be in the cast, what the plot is going to be about, or they don't even have a director as of yet. But uh, there is word that within Disney, they really want to go big with this. They really want to have this movie be a massive deal, especially with the fact that they do have Scarlett Johansson involved to both produce and to star in the film. So they're, hope they're, they're hopefully going to have their next big movie with this one, maybe award winning even, because again, they do have Scarlett Johansson and who knows, maybe Scarlett might help Disney out to go and get more of that gold that is not related to animation. Oh, and uh, speaking of which, uh, they do actually have a writer on board, and it, it, is, it is actually going to be a Pixar veteran, to which it will be Josh Cooley who's going to go and write the script. And if you may recall, again, Josh Cooley is a Pixar veteran uh, whom recently is credited as a writer for Inside Out and the Oscar-winning director of Toy Story 4. Now, by the way, there is one more thing I would like to mention is that technically, this is not going to be the first time that the Tower of Terror is going to be turned into a movie, or even the first major attempt from Disney to actually bring the Tower of Terror onto the big screen. Reading here from my source here on the Collider, it states here, the ride was previously turned into a 1997 movie starring Steve Gutenberg and, Ki and Kirsten Dunst, uh, though a new theatrical feature had been in development since 2015, when John August was tapped to write a treatment about five people in a posh hotel who take an elevator and disappear after it is hit by lightning. So that's pretty much the big thing, the fact that we are getting a Tower of Terror movie. And like I said before, Disney lately seems to be on a massive high of trying to turn many of their rides into feature films. Like I said, they're trying to make a Haunted Mansion reboot. They're trying to do a Space Mountain movie. Even on Disney+, Plus, they're planning to do this massive television Disney Parks universe, starting with a series uh, based on the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. And now they're going to include another one uh, to which they're going to be working on the Tower of Terror reboot. Uh, 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 yeah, I guess you could say technically it is a Tower of Terror reboot, considering there was a movie before. And by the way, there is one more thing I would like to mention is that, funny enough, um, I remember there was a time in my childhood I used to watch the Tower of Terror reboot like all the time. Like, it, it actually used to be... Uh, a Halloween tradition for me, believe it or not. Like, there, there was at one point for, for many, many years, every Halloween, me and my family, we would always go and watch, in that order, Hocus Pocus and Tower of Terror. It, it, it's been that much attached uh, to my Halloween childhood. So, like, yeah, I, I will agree, though, I mean... I mean, it is a TV movie after all. It is campy as F. It is corny. It is cheesy. Like, it is pretty much an entire cord field with little pigs that will become ham. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's pretty dumb. But it is that kind of enjoyable corniness. It is that kind of enjoyable dumb. Especially, like, considering that it is for the Halloween time. It's kind of, like, in the same veins as, like, the Rankin-Bass holiday specials on Christmas. It has that same kind of campiness, but for Halloween with uh, Tower of Terror. Plus the fact that I always find it to be really cool of the fact that they actually filmed in the actual Tower of Terror. That they went to, uh, that they actually filmed this at the uh, at the actual attraction at Disney's Hollywood Studios in Walt Disney World. So that's what that 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 I always find to be uh pretty cool. So like uh, like you know, how else would you want to be like 
completely authentic to the experience uh, than to actually film at the place where people would actually have that experience in the first place. So uh, definitely some great points on that. But anyways, um, going back into this, going back into the discussion about the Tower of Terror movie. Now, I will admit, at first, I wasn't necessarily so keen on the idea, especially with how nowadays uh, Disney is trying to do all these different reboots of, uh, of their old rides. And there was a part of me, honestly, I felt like, well, why can't they just let the rides be the rides? Do we really need that kind of treatment to turn all these attractions into something? something like Pirates of the Caribbean. I know that like they're kind of setting themselves up in case uh, the Jungle Cruise would become this massive hit. But then again, I, like I'm not really on board with that kind of idea, especially if it would end up tainting uh, the original rides themselves. If you would end up uh, turning it into what happened to Pirates of the Caribbean and it would just be nothing but the uh, like it would be nothing but the, the whole movie franchise instead of just letting the rides be their own thing to just be the rides and that's it I, I even to this day i still miss the days of like when pirate uh, of like when pirates of the caribbean was just a ride and like i know this is going to be very controversial but i do wish that honestly one day disney would actually remove all those um, movie references take away all the all the johnny depp animatronics and just let the ride be itself just like pirates of the caribbean be Pirates of the Caribbean and not necessarily associated to the movie. But with that said though, I will say out of all the mo out of all the projects that Disney has announced uh in terms of like turning one of their rides into a movie, this one I got to say has the most promise. And the reason why I say that for now is because of the people who are attached to it. Number one, you got Scarlett Johansson, a real like a really great actress who has provided a lot of amazing roles, especially when recently uh, she has been getting a lot of attention uh, from award season, especially uh, with what she recently did with uh, movies such as Marriage Story and Jojo Rabbit. So that definitely is a great point for her to not only uh, be the star of the movie, but also kind of surprising the fact that she uh, she is also a producer. I'm kind of surprised like she would actually have interest in this kind of movie. And like like, man, like I, I don't necessarily mean like this uh, suspense kind of like horror thriller kind of thing, but I mean more like the fact that she is making a movie based on a Disney ride. So that is honestly something a little bit intriguing. Uh, that and also uh, the fact that they got Josh Cooley to be the writer. I mean, say what you will about Toy Story 4. I absolutely adore that movie and I do find it to be on par with the other Toy Story films. But like you can't deny that the writing in Inside Out is absolutely spectacular. And yeah, Josh Cooley is only one of the people that wrote on it, but still though, the fact that you do have a Pixar veteran whose writing experience at one point involved Inside Out, the fact that that person will be writing the script, I think that is a major plus. The fact that you do have a veteran who was like raised in a very Disney environment, like you can't like it's hard to say if you can really go better than that. So I definitely trust Josh Cooley could actually do could actually go and do a really amazing job so far. So that's honestly the only things that I would say so far has my interest on this. And at, at, the, at the end of the day, can you actually go and make a legitimate Tower of Terror movie? Like, can you do one that is not like campy in the levels of of that 1997 movie. Honestly, I think you can. I think there is enough material in there uh to actually make things work. Uh, to make to make things work. Sorry about that. Um but there is one thing that I do want to say that I would absolutely love to see from this. Like if it is possible, like I don't know if Disney could do it because I know they don't really have the rights to it, but if they can, I would love to see the Twilight Zone be attached to this. Because technically, the, the full name of the ride is technically the Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror. And I know, like, technically, Disney doesn't own the Twilight Zone. It is, like, technically a property. I think right now, it, it, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's owned by CBS Viacom right now. But if they can have the rights to actually have that 
be attached to this. If they can get the Twilight Zone brand and be attached to their Twilight Zone movie, that would be perfect, especially if they could find a way to digitally bring back uh, Rod Sterling to do his classic narration and to actually bring people onto the Twilight Zone. That would honestly be awesome. I would be so down uh, to, act, to, to actually see that happen, where we see Disney trying to do their own version of a reboot of the Twilight Zone that will be different uh, than um, uh, Jordan. Uh, no, what, what? Yeah, Jordan Peele. Uh, that like when he did uh, his reboot. So yeah, honestly, overall. Like, I know this is just Disney desperately trying to continuously reboot uh, or tur continuously turn their rides into movies. And I know that a lot of them are not even going to happen in the first place. But this one, I will say, has my interest, especially when they got ScarJo involved, uh, that they got Josh Cooley involved in the writing. This could actually have some legitimate potential. I could actually see this really work out as a movie now of course this is very early stages like if this does happen we won't see this happen until like maybe in 2025 or something like that but still though if it does happen then i'll definitely be keeping an eye on it all right so with that said though uh i would like to go into the uh chat wall and i would like to ask you all how do you feel about uh, this new Tower of Terror movie from Scarlett Johansson. Would you guys be on board with this? Are you a little iffy on this kind of idea? Let me know what you are. Well, let me know what you think on this. Let's see. I never watched the Tower of Terror TV movie, but I did really enjoy the ride. I'm actually pretty surprised about the idea of turning the Tower of Terror as a theatrical movie. I actually enjoy Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, Ka, Mindy, and many more, but it will uh, it will do good. Uh oh, but will will it do good? And will it be released if Jungle Cruise becomes a hit at the box office? Let's just see. I'm actually looking forward to this idea, but will Disney actually get the rights to the Twilight Zone from Viacom CBS? Honestly, I don't know. Like, this is, I'm just speaking. Like, I'm just speaking my mind, and I'm just brainstorming, and I'm just suggesting things that would be really awesome to see. So, I don't know if Disney would be able to, but again, if they can, great. Uh, let's see what else we got. In my youth. It did went to many theme parks and amusement parks. Not only the sounds are really loud, hello to hello to tinnitus, uh, but some rides and attractions are really too uh, epi uh, epileptic and motion sickness factories. And as an Aspie, big stimuli like these are really bad for my psyche. So I won't watch this movie reboot of that ride that uh, I didn't went uh, in my life. Maybe it's a fun one, but... I hate unprotected elevators. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I, I mean, if they do make this, I can imagine that, yeah, they'll stay true to the tone of it. But, uh, of course, they will be careful that they're not going to go into levels of, like, crazy epilepsy. You know, they're, they're, this is not going to be the kind of movie that I can imagine... They'll be like, um, you know, they won't do like Incredibles 2 or Spider-Verse where they got to put out signs to say uh, like there's going to be epilepsy warnings. You know, I, I don't think they will go and legit do that. Uh, let's see now. This does have my interest considering how nowadays Disney really is obsessed with turning the rides into movies and it has Scarlett Johansson attached to it. So it could have uh, potentiality. Uh, it's interesting considering the Tower of Terror is in a weird position considering that one is in Disneyland and has been turned into Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout while the one in Disney World is still there. But then again, you got to keep in mind that the one in Disney World is one of the most iconic attractions of the entire resort, not just of Disney Hollywood Studios, but of the entirety of Walt Disney World. I mean, you got to keep in mind nowadays, the icon of Disney's Hollywood Studios, like the, the iconography is actually Tower of Terror, where like in Animal Kingdom, you got Tree of Life. In the Magic Kingdom, you got the Cinderella Castle. In Epcot, you got Spaceship Earth. At uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios, you got Tower of Terror. I personally find it to be a weird choice, but it is that iconic. So if you want to go with your with the, if you want to go with their major attractions, that could potentially be an idea. <gasps> oh, actually, I don't know why. I'm just gonna say this right now, like it just clicked in my head. Now I don't know if they would actually do this, 
But one crazy idea that they could do is that maybe it won't be based on that Tower of Terror in particular. But one thing that I can imagine that they could do is that they could actually make a movie based on the Tower of Terror from Tokyo Disneyland. If you guys don't know, uh, considering that Disney wasn't able to get the rights to the Twilight Zone for Tokyo Disneyland, what they did instead is that they created a completely original story for that Tower of Terror. And it's actually a really interesting one as well. It's actually really cool. Uh, I recommend that you go and uh, check it out to see for yourself of, uh, of the whole story of what they did for that Tower of Terror. If they're able to do that, that would actually be really cool. I would be also down with that as well. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? A tired, old uh, a tired old joke shot down when a group of space bounty hunters took over a... Oh, <laughs> A tired... Oh, hold on a sec. I need to get it to the mood. A tired old joke shut down when a group of space bounty hunters took over a 60s... Uh, took over a 60s... The fame... What? Oh, took over the 60s. The famous sci-fi building before Air Arbor Day. Uh, before Arbor Day. Hold on, I need to redo that. Sorry. It's just uh, the, the... The dialogue... It's just uh, the way it's written here. It's um, it, it, It's kind of like a little messed up. A tired old joke shot down when a group of space bounty hunters took over a, 60, a 60s famous sci-fi building before Arbor Day. But now in the veins of Tony Goldmark's recurring nightmares, prepare yourself as Black Widow resurrects a troll joke from the grave alongside the new Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror, the new Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror, the new Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror, the new Twilight Zone of Tower Oh, man, yeah, that, honestly, that was one of the first things that I actually thought of when I heard of this news. It's like, Disney is making the new Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror, the new Twilight Zone of Tower of Terror. Oh, my God. Man, that, that was a classic, uh, episode, honestly. All right, so, uh... With that said, I think that should pretty much do it for uh, today. Uh, well, not not for the whole episode. Keep in mind, that should do it for this story. So, yeah, I mean, if Disney does it, then, hey, they got the right people for it. I will give them that. And now it is time that we shall get on to the grand finale. And for this finale, I decided... Why not go and do something a little bit fun? Something a little bit enjoyable? And uh, this is going to be a little bit of a celebration, per se, to go and honor the 25th anniversary of a very special animated feature. One that I would even say would be one of the most underrated Disney animated films. And what I'm talking about is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes, last week on June 21st, it was the 25th anniversary of Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And one way people decided to celebrate it was with a New York Times interview where they have interviewed some of the uh, directors, writers, and producers to discuss and reminisce the times when they have created The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which, while underrated, I will give it credit, though, that nowadays it has definitely gathered a uh, cult following. But the one thing that I do want to discuss, however, one interesting way to celebrate it, uh, is with this Hollywood Reporter article where they highlighted that in that interview from the New York Times, there were actually two instances uh, that Disney had to do in order to really bump up the uh, rating in order or or tone down the rating, I should say, in order to get it to that G rating. Because um, in the words of uh, one of the writers, uh, or in the words of the writer, Tad Murphy, uh, he stated that Disney was willing to take some chances in that movie that I don't think they'd take today. That's a PG-13 in my book. And even also mention that it is the most R-rated G you will ever see in your life. And I mean, when you think of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, it definitely is true because a lot of the tones, a lot of the subject matter, uh, a, a lot of the subjects that would they that that the movie would get into, yeah, they were very much adult. They were very much serious, and uh, it had a lot more of an edge than most other Disney animated features. 
But the two instances that I just want to bring up over here uh, and what this article actually highlighted were two moments that because of a few sound effects, they were able to get that G rating. One of which was in the Hellfire sequence. Of course, you guys probably know Hellfire. And yeah, of course, that would be a subject of controversy in which the Motion Picture Association of America would be a bit concerned that a kid's movie would have a sequence as uh, freaking Hellfire. Not to mention, like, the language of uh, Hellfire and even the insinuation that Frollo is pretty much in a self-conflict between his faith with the church and his... His lust for Esmeralda. But among all the things that the MPAA would be concerned about, the only thing they questioned was actually the word sin. They weren't necessarily that okay with the fact that in a Disney movie, Frollo would actually use the word sin. Uh, more specifically, it was the part where Frollo would say, this burning desire is turning me to sin. And they try to figure out what what did they want to do? What would be an idea? And I'll just go and read a, a little bit from my source here on The Hollywood Reporter for their idea, uh, to which it states, but the soundtrack, uh, the, the problem is, though, is that when the, uh, by the way, when the MPAA suggested to go and try to change that up, when they brought up the sin problem, they mentioned the soundtrack was finished recording and the secret, the sequence was already animated. So the team used a solution suggested by producer Don Hahn. As that group of hooded figures rush up from the floor, the team made a whoosh sound of their robes louder, effectively drowning out Tony J singing Sin and earning the approval of the MPAA. So if you want some proof, by the way, I actually have the clip uh, prepared. So l let's just go and quickly hear that a little bit. So... So you actually hear that, right? Like, when he was about to say sin, like, you just hear the... <sighs> like, let, let's just go and quickly hear that again. So that was one suggestion. Is to go and try to drown out that word so it could quickly go and slip over the heads of people that... Uh, pe that, that the idea of a Disney character, even if it is a Disney villain literally turning to sin, yeah, like, they, they, they want to try to, like, slip away from that. But then there is also another thing that they have suggested, uh, another instance that the MPAA was actually very concerned, and that, and that actually was Frollo's confrontation with Esmeralda. After Esmeralda called for sanctuary and that she was safe uh, within the uh, confines of Notre Dame, that's when Frollo got Esmeralda alone and he got a little too close. You, you guys probably remember that moment where, uh, you know, he, he got a little, like, it's probably Frollo at his uh, creepiest. And especially with the infamous moment where, like, as he was talking to her, he decided to go and sniff her hair. And that was actually a massive concern. But the one thing, oddly enough, that the MPAA was actually kind of concerned about was not necessarily the action itself or the insinuation that Frollo wants to sleep with Esmeralda. It was actually the sound that Frollo makes when sniffing Esmeralda. They were a little bit concerned that maybe the sniff was a little too loud. So what Disney decided to do, instead of animating, instead of doing anything, they, just, they, they decided to just lower down the volume on the sniff. And apparently, that was the key for them to actually get that G rating. And if you don't believe me, let's actually go and check out that clip. I actually got it right over here. So yeah, this little uncomfortable moment with uh, Frollo and Esmeralda. And gypsies don't do well inside stone walls. What are you doing? It's like barely audible. Like, if you heard it, it's almost like a very silent inhale. 
But I did think about it, actually. And there is some truth to that, believe it or not. Because, like, if you take away, like, some of the sniff sound, like, it kind of makes it less creepy. I'll prove it to you. Like, if you make it, like, if you make the, uh, if you make the sniff sound, if you make the sniff sound prominent, it would actually have a bit of a different tone. Like, uh, uh, observe. I'll, I'll, I'll go and provide the, uh, sound effect. These don't do well inside stone walls. <laughs> what are you doing? I was just imagining. You can tell there is a bit of a difference. Like, with that sniff, it's like, yeah, the, the, like, I, I guess in a way to describe it is that the sniff would actually emphasize Frollo's horniness in a way. Like, it would, it, like, it, it, like, imagine if you would have someone sniff someone, like, it, it, if you have someone sniff your hair, there is a vast difference, like, there, there is a bit of, a, of that vast difference. Like, imagine. Like, if someone sniffs, sniffs your hair like this, and then you would have someone sniff your hair like this, Walls. What are you doing? There is that big difference. Like, one is just a total obsessive creeper, and the other one is a lot more subtle, and maybe not as desperately horny. So I, I think it's like, taking away that sniff... It, t you know, it takes away the desperate nature of Frollo. You know, it's like when taking away the sniff, it'll just feel like, yeah, he's not as desperate to go and sleep with Esmeralda. He's not like as fully consumed to sin. So honestly, it's one of those, we it it's one of those things like it sounds weird, but in a way I get it. It's, it's like, it actually does make sense because like the louder the sniff is, the more that he really is putting in effort in sniffing on Esmeralda's hair. And I don't know why, suddenly I, I'm getting like flashes of like Philbo, uh, of Philbo's videos when he would do those um, Animal Crossing videos. I don't know if you guys watch Philbo, but oh my god, that dude is such a hilarious Nintendo YouTuber. And like often like a repeated gag that happens all the time is when his, um, is when his chat wall would keep demanding uh, when he would play Animal Crossing. It's like, chat says to sniff him! <laughs> that would be, yeah, that would be one thing, yeah. That would be, that would be amazing. Honestly, I could see that actually happen. Like, if you play Animal Crossing and you dress up your character like, uh, like, you dress up your character like Frollo. You're just frolicking around. <laughs> it's like, oh, hey, Isabel, how's it going? <laughs> that would totally be a thing that Animal Crossing players would do. They would dress up like Frollo, and they would just go and sniff on 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 the female characters. They would just get behind uh, on someone like Isabelle and just like, or or like, I, I, I don't, I never really played Animal Crossing, so I don't really know other characters or anything like that. So, yeah, you can about you can imagine like I, I like people will definitely abuse the sniffing option in Animal Crossing New Horizons and they'll they'll dress up like Frollo just to recreate this moment in particular. But yeah, it definitely is true when you do think about it of all the crazy things that they would have to do in order to get that G rating because after all, we are talking about Disney. And Disney is very strict when it comes to their brand. And it's very rare that they would even hand out a PG-13 rating while still maintaining the Disney brand. Like, even for, like, even when Hamilton was released on Disney Plus last year, they got extremely lucky that they were given at least one F. Like, there were a few rare instances where things did get censored, but... They did let them get away with one F word. You know, it's kind of like that Spider-Man meme. It's like, this is my one F. I should, like, this is my one F. And I shall give this to you. So Lin-Manuel Miranda really got lucky with that. Uh, but yeah, honestly, the, the, the funny thing is, though, is that in this article in particular, they did actually do bring up the factor that when it comes to uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, yeah, they definitely have done so many things in here that not just Disney, but no other animated feature would get away with. At least if they want to keep themselves uh, on a on a G rating. Like, 
nowadays, if this did get released, I would say, yeah, they definitely would, they definitely would get a PG-13 rating. This is a legit, like, this is the closest we would ever see Disney to making a PG-13 movie. And, 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 like, debatably, other than Fantasia, this is their most adult feature film, especially when they would get into subject matters such as um, religion and even, in some ways, temptation i was about to say sex but i think like a better term would be uh temptation as well and even like a little bit of a, co a a social commentary on immigration as well since it does talk about uh sanctuary since that is also a very heavy and prominent fe theme onto this so yeah honestly like, nowadays, it's very rare that you would see uh, another movie like The Hunchback of Notre Dame be made, especially when it's the kind of film that would really take risks to get into those very serious subject matter that no animation studio to this day would actually have the balls to do so. Not even DreamWorks, not even Illumination, not even Pixar, not even Sony, none of them would actually go into that level's of the Hunchback of Notre Dame unless they want to aim for a PG-13 rating. Like, even, like, yeah, like, some people could say, okay, well, maybe this is more PG, you know, maybe this is more PG, especially when you do have uh, the gargoyles that are meant to be more entertaining for the children. Like, yeah, there would be that, but when, it, like, when, this is one of those movies where when it gets dark, it is, like, some of the darkest moments that the studio has ever crafted. But then again, those are the moments that definitely does make me appreciate this movie so much more uh it's one of my favorite disney movies i've said that many times before in the past and again i do find this to be underrated and yes there is that like there is that prominent fan base that it does have but then again i i, I do say that it is underrated because like I, I feel like disney doesn't treat it like they should, because for me at least, in my opinion, I feel like Hunchback of Notre Dame is definitely in the levels of some of the earlier uh, Disney Renaissance movies. Like, this is honestly in the leagues of films such as The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, uh, The Lion King, and all that kind of stuff. It really is that good. So, honestly... Like, looking back into this, it's kind of shocking to think that nowadays we have reached the point that The Hunchback of Notre Dame is officially uh, 25 years old. But man, those 25 years and the things that they have done in this movie, it's just, it's spectacular. It really is such a phenomenal movie and definitely one of those Disney films that I highly recommend people watch, so... Yeah, definitely a great film. Uh, still surprising to this day that Disney got away with so many like of these dark themes. And all you had to do is just like add in and manipulate some sound effects and you'll, the MPAA will let you get away with a whole lot of things. So yeah, overall though, definitely a great look back into such a, a great Disney animated film. And uh, kind of a funny story that they have revealed as well that just a few sound effects can really change ev everything. All right, so with that said and done, uh, I would like to go and move on to the chat wall. And I would like to ask you all, um, do you have any special memories or any comments you would like to say about the Hunchback of Notre Dame, especially with the uh, sound effects element? Uh, do you feel like the Hunchback is more of a PG-13 movie? Do you think the G rating makes sense? Let me know what you think on this one. Let's see. This is definitely a fascinating story. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, while not one of my favorite Disney animated films, it is definitely one of the most underrated animated films from Disney, considering all the adult themes in the film, they had to do uh, a, a lot to make this film a G rating. Also, Matt, I have to ask, um, are you always this horny? If so, then should I call the horny police? Hey, okay, to be fair, hold on a sec, but okay, before you call the horny police... Let me just say this. Okay, in my defense, at least with this episode, I am pretty tame, okay? I know that some of you maybe are not used to me being horny, but still, though, the, the like, with this episode right over here, I've been pretty calm. I've been pretty tame, at least compared to the last episode when I was talking about Catwoman and uh, the whole Batman controversy where, uh, you know, the one where heroes don't do that. So yeah, I just want to go and emphasize that right now. So like, 
yeah, I know there are times when I can have my horny moments, but this time around, it's like, come on, I've been pretty tame, to be fair, people. Okay. Uh, let's see now. First off, happy birthday to this movie. Second, I'm not surprised if these decisions weren't influenced by lobbies. Third, uh, have you heard about the musical made in 1999 in France with music by Ricardo, uh... Cocchiante and lyrics translated by Will Jennings. Uh, that's a banger musical. If I haven't heard, uh, if I haven't heard one in years, here's a link. Oh, oh my God, Notre Dame de Paris, dude. Trust me, I, I I've been living with a family that adores freaking Notre Dame de Paris. It's it's one of those things that I know that. For my family, at least with, like, with, with my mom and my sister, they would go and immediately go get tickets whenever uh, Notre Dame de Paris comes near my area. So, like, trust me. You tell me about Notre Dame de Paris, yeah, I am all familiar with it. In fact, I think for a school contest, I had to sing one of those songs, like, Il est venu le temps des cathédrales Le monde passé dans un nouveau millénaire. You know, I might have butchered the lyrics, but yes, I am quite familiar with that uh, with that one. All right, let's see now. Hunchback is currently one of my favorite Disney films, so getting to learn how they were able to get away with a G rating is quite fascinating. It is indeed sad that Disney doesn't really show off more of this movie, but considering our standards nowadays, I might understand why they wouldn't do it. I still remember watching the Hunchback of Notre Dame musical nearly three years ago. You know what? I should probably watch this movie again after the podcast. You should, dude. You definitely should. There's always a good time to watch uh, The Hunchback. Let's see. Matt, in the future, could you please not use the G slur when referring to Romani people? Okay, I, I apologize. Not, I don't mean to offend people. If I offend, if I have offended anyone uh, by saying gypsies or anything like that, I do apologize. It is not meant to be a slur. So I just want to emphasize that right now. That being said, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the possible remake, only Frollo would say that slur. That being said, it is a movie that has aged surprisingly well in terms of the themes and message of being more prevalent since 1996. Oh, absolutely, dude. Especially with, like, there are very few f animated films nowadays that has this level of commentary in terms of religion. Like, the most that I could think of is probably some of the Cartoon Saloon films like Wolf Walkers and The Secret of Kells. Uh, let's see now. The Hunchback of Notre Dame may not be, uh, may not be one of my favorite. Oh, no, wait. I oh, know. Okay. I know. I've okay. I didn't read this one. The Hunchback of Notre Dame may not be one of my favorite Disney uh, Disney animated films, but uh, the lengths of getting this film G rated is really crazy. I always question why this film was rated G when I was a kid when it featured some some serious subject matter. But now I get why. If this came out in a PG or PG thirteen rating right now, maybe things could have been different. I don't love it, but uh, it's a pretty good film overall. So happy anniversary to this film. Yeah, that's also another major thing that you got to keep in mind. It is that The Hunchback of Notre Dame was made in the mid-1990s. And the standards of what would be considered PG or G or PG-13 or R, they're way different compared to how things now. So that's also a major factor that, uh, that, that plays into Hunchback's G rating is the fact that it is a 1996 film. Uh, let's see now. While I never watched The Hunchback, uh, even though I really should, yes, you should, uh, I always find it interesting about what happens uh, when creating movies, especially with censoring. The amount of things they managed to get away with, even for a film in the 1990s, is both crazy yet oddly respectful. Also, uh, since you talked about Failboat, uh, what is your favorite video from him? Oh, good question. Good question. Honestly, um, some of my fa honestly some of my favorites are actually some of the uh, some of the Photoshop videos that he would do. That are also the first video that I've ever seen from him is when he ha uh, when he opened up uh, Blender and he decided to manipulate some of the models of uh, of Super Smash Bros Ultimate. Oh, and the, uh, oh, and also like a lot of the mod videos are also a lot of fun, especially uh, rather be from Failboat or from Jmoji. Those are always great to watch. All right, I think I'll go and read uh, one more comment before we cap things off. 
uh, while, uh, while I hardly understand what this story was about, but if I can, if I can make a statement now, The Hunchback of Notre Dame is one of my favorite Disney films. Like almost everything about it, uh, I just love watching it repeatedly. The characters, the songs, and the, uh, uh, and especially the animation is really sells me to be one of Disney's greatest films. In fact, Out There is one of my other favorite songs, along with Friend Like Me, uh, another Mankin masterpiece. Overall, happy anniversary, Hunchback. And I think with that said, that should go and cap things off for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. What a fun little adventure that we went into with this one. So, tune in next week for more fun-filled stories to pop up, maybe more fun-filled trailers. And with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for watching, thank you all so much for listening, and until next time, see you later, dudes!